the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast is back for another episode. Join Mark S. Ryan, a veteran health plan and health technology executive, as he explores the world of healthcare. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. My name is Mark Ryan. It's a pleasure to be hosting the podcast, and thanks to everyone who's listening in. You might have noticed a couple of changes here with this podcast. Uh, There's some music and an intro. There's going to be some music with an outro. And there's also going to be uh, a couple of ads now that we're featuring. Initially, the ads are going to be talking about the Healthcare Labyrinth website with the news feed blog and podcast and also how to purchase my book, The Healthcare Labyrinth. So we'll be taking a couple of breaks during the podcast, breaking it up a little bit, uh, which will be uh, nice as well. So let's get right to the topic of today's podcast. It's about King Charles of the United Kingdom's uh, cancer diagnosis and what it really means to healthcare in the United Kingdom, as well as what it might tell us a little bit about the United States as well. And uh, so let's get right to it here. Um, In a number of blogs and even in podcasts, I've covered some of these topics. We're going to get into the differences a little bit between developed countries' healthcare systems out there. We're going to talk a little bit about the UK system. Some of you might have read the blog series about my daughter's brain surgery, which will also cover that also covered a little bit about the United Kingdom and the differences. But I thought that the King's diagnosis of cancer gave us a chance to maybe reflect a little more deeply on what's going on in the UK and actually what's going on in America. So for those who aren't aware, in early February, Buckingham Palace announced that King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. Um, The royal family in the United Kingdom is often very close vested about what's going on in their personal lives. Um, That doesn't stop the media from trying to uncover it, of course. But a general policy of the royals is, is that we don't talk about our personal lives in public. At the same time, they also want to have a balance where there is some accountability about the health and welfare of the royal family as well as what's going on with them. So it's it's a little bit of a mixed bag. So when Queen Elizabeth was queen before she died in the last couple of years, um, she did publicize some of her health care events throughout her life. And in some cases, that was meant to really encourage people to take care of themselves and get preventative care and screenings and things like that. Well, King Charles has sort of taken a page from his mother's book here. And again, Buckingham Palace announced that King Charles was diagnosed with cancer. Little more was really said about what kind of cancer or even the severity or the progress of that cancer in his body. What they have said is the king is undergoing treatment. We got a tiny bit of a glimpse from Rishi Sunak, the prime minister of the United Kingdom, when in a recent press interview, Sunak basically indicated that the king's cancer was caught very early. So that might suggest a a very good prognosis for the king. And there's other articles within uh, the United Kingdom that talks about King Charles's decision to move into Buckingham Palace from his current residence over the next couple of years, and things are going on to uh, make that happen. So he's clearly continuing to plan for the long term and things like that. So that's the good news, and we're very happy that the king hopefully caught his cancer early, it can be treated, and he continues to live a long, happy life as his mother did uh, in well into her 90s, right? At the same time, the king's announcement does shine a bit of a light on some of the problems that the United Kingdom's healthcare system is having. 
Uh, and again, I've covered a little bit about this in my blogs, even talking about it from the standpoint of my daughter, who is connected to the United Kingdom um, National Health Service. I've noted that the health service, the National Health Service, just celebrated this year its 75th anniversary of its founding back in 1948, a few years after World War II ended. Um, and I've also discussed the fact that the United Kingdom took one of three approaches to uh, having a universal access healthcare system. They chose the socialized medicine approach where the government funds, directs, runs, and largely provides all of the healthcare services in the system. Perhaps one of the exceptions is the fact that private doctors really largely at the primary care level contract with the National Health Service to provide primary care to uh, the citizens of the United Kingdom. Other nations in Europe have a universal access system, but took two different forms uh, of healthcare access. Uh, the second, I'd say, is what's known as single payer, where the government funds and directs the system, but private entities by and large provide services. There are some exceptions to that, but by and large, private hospitals, private uh, physicians, and so on provide the services under contract with the government. And that's a little bit sort of like the traditional Medicare program in our system, where in that case, CMS is contracting with these private providers to uh, provide care to Medicare enrollees. And the third sort of developed world system is what's known as private affordable universal access, where the government will direct and subsidize uh, uh, care in some cases for low income people, but by and large, private entities, private health plans, and private providers otherwise run the insurance system and provide the services. Um, so, again, uh, the United Kingdom took the socialized medicine route. And as I say, the King's announcement sort of shined a light on some of the holes in that system that are emerging. By and large, the citizens of the United Kingdom have a great deal of pride about the system. They believe it's a model for nations. They believe that by and large, it certainly serves citizens well. But in the last, say, 10 to 20 years, those holes have begun to emerge. And the king's uh, cancer and the services he's gotten are sort of now in newspaper stories in the United Kingdom being compared with what the average citizen uh, receives uh, when they have a major health event. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, criticisms that's happening. So after the, after the King's announcement, uh, a number of articles, as I've said, uh, have sort of come forward, both in the United States and the United Kingdom, saying that, listen, the king, uh, you know, received the best care. He was actually in the hospital for um, a procedure related to an enlarged prostate. The cancer was found during that episode or that event. Uh, it doesn't look like the king has prostate cancer, but another form of cancer that was found um, uh, during that enlarged prostate procedure. And what many are saying is that the king likely received much quicker service at the specialty level and now is being treated much more quickly than the average citizen citizen would. And the negative news really centers on the long wait times for specialists and treatment services in the UK system. And the articles indicate that this impacts the timely diagnosis of life-threatening conditions and impacts how quickly one gets treated and indirectly the morbidity and mortality of these individuals um, when they have these major life events with cancer or other conditions that pop up. We do know that early detection of cancer and other conditions is critical. Uh, so screening is important, but once there is that cancer event 
or another serious condition that pops up, finding it quickly, treating it quickly is extremely important. Uh, so indeed, in the case of the king, while, again, we do not know the form of the cancer, the prime minister announced it was found quickly. He's being treated, and and hopefully the prognosis is great. So nobody is begrudging the king the fact that uh, they found his cancer earlier. He's getting treated. Um, but nonetheless, people are now asking uh, why every citizen in the United Kingdom is not able to ac access the same kind of services the king did quickly uh, and get treated quickly as well. In one article that I posted in a blog I did on this subject as well, it talked about average citizens waiting months for a diagnosis and treatment for various server, uh, uh, conditions uh, or cancers. In one case, um, a woman was highlighted in her, you know, middle-aged woman who was diagnosed with colorectal cancer only after waiting many months to find out about that cancer. Um, she eventually was diagnosed with stage four cancer. The implication is that if she was seen earlier, the cancer uh, might have been at an earlier stage and more treatable. And even then, she had delays related to treating that cancer or would have had delays waited to treating for that cancer. So she did have access to private insurance that is popping up in the system because of the problems and actually began treatment privately for chemotherapy that way. And so she's treating her stage four colorectal cancer with chemotherapy in the private system that's emerging in the UK as opposed to in the public system. And the article notes that thousands of people get the same message every day from the NHS, that uh, there's a paucity of specialists, a paucity of treatment uh, centers, and, and a long wait time in order to diagnose and treat cancer and other conditions. And Many of those people simply do not have the means to access the private system through private insurance or pay it outright. So again, juxtaposition between the service and the swiftness that the king is receiving and what thousands of, of um, UK um, citizens face each, each day, in fact. Um, Many think the UK system is a bit in crisis due to a lack of adequate funding, advanced technology, and enough qualified personnel. And what we'll do is when we get back from the break here, we'll talk a little bit more about um, that issue as well. The Healthcare Labyrinth is no ordinary website. It features news and commentary from one of the nation's leading healthcare policy and technology experts. Mark Ryan combs the internet for the latest healthcare news and publishes a news feed each weekday with summations and Mark's insights. Twice a week, Mark publishes a blog to go deep into a current issue. And of course, Mark hosts a podcast each week to delve even further. All of this is available at healthcarelabyrinth.com. Visit each day for the latest happenings in healthcare. As well, learn more about Mark's book, The Healthcare Labyrinth, at the website. That's healthcarelabyrinth.com, your go-to source for healthcare news. Welcome back. And before the first break here, we talked a little bit about the fact that many view the UK system as being in crisis due to a lack of adequate funding, advanced technology, and enough qualified personnel out there. So this newspaper article I've talked about from the Associated Press, notes that United Kingdom health officials aim to have 75% or three quarters of patients with suspected cancer to receive a diagnosis within four weeks of referral and 85% of them to wait less than two months for their first treatment. Now, many of us in America would argue that those kind of wait times, four weeks for a referral and uh, within two months to receive a first treatment is clearly a long wait time in and of itself. But what's more important is, at the very least, a study of the English portion 
of the NHS. The NHS sort of has four different pieces, the English, the Scottish, the Welsh, and the Northern Irish portion. Uh, so the English being by far the largest, the English portion of the NHS has not even been able to meet those targets of one month and two months um, since 2015. So as much as those targets in America would be seen as very long, uh, uh, the NHS does not appear to be able to meet those targets. And I would also note some of the literature suggests that access in various uh, nations of the UK, like Northern Ireland, or in rural areas throughout the overall United Kingdom, wait times can be even worse than what is seen as more in more urban areas. So one in three in the UK wait well more than two months to start the treatment, according to latest statistics. And at least 225,000 people have waited too long beyond those timeframes since roughly 2020. And what's more, the article also interestingly says that once you do commence treatment, there is generally less treatment than in other nations for uh, these cancer types. So overall, it's showing that the UK survival rates are lower than other developed nations for those that develop cancer. And I would suspect that this is the same thing related perhaps to other life-threatening conditions that, that individuals have. Now, I would say that at least part of this appears unique to the United Kingdom. They seem to be battling troubles related to very tight funding and lack of uh, long-term planning and things like that. And so we have to sort of put some of these wait times and some of this paucity of specialists and other modern technology and treatment services on the back of UK health planners. But it's also the case that this is not an uncommon occurrence in terms of lower technology access and delays and wait times is, is also something that many of the socialized medicine and single payer, and to some degree, even the affordable universal private access models in other developed countries do see. Uh, in many cases, sort of a global budgeting approach is taken in these socialized medicine and single payer countries, and therefore that implicitly creates some problems. And we do see this as an example in our neighbor to the North Canada, where sometimes people access the United States system and pay out of pocket because they cannot get timely access to life-saving treatment in the case of cancer, but even for other things like knee replacement and things like that, that often occur later in life. And this is also seen in other developed countries too beyond the UK. So part of it maybe is on lack of planning on the part of the UK, but part of it is sort of uh, what occurs in some of these socialized and single payer systems in general. Private insurance options and private providers, therefore, are rising in any number of developed countries out, out there, especially with socialized medicine and single payer. And as I point out, even in the private developed systems out there, buying beyond what would be the mandated insurance and the service levels is very common as well. So even in the private systems, uh, people will, through their insurer, buy additional services, which gives them better access and shorter time frames to access services as well. So what can we really conclude here? Well, number one, I don't want to jump the gun and condemn any healthcare system. Let's go back uh, and think about a little bit about a Commonwealth Fund study that I also wrote about that talks about the three systems, again, socialized medicine, single payer, as well as provided affordable, private affordable universal access. And the Commonwealth Fund sort of studied 11 countries and the United States, uh, and those other developed countries had all three of those types, right? And what they found in looking at the efficiency and quality of each of these systems, 
is that all three of those systems were among the top five highest quality and efficient systems in the world. And the United Kingdom was actually in the top five. So it's hard to condemn socialized medicine, single payer, or other private models out there compared with the United States. They all tend to perform pretty well on efficiency and quality outcomes. In the United States, as we know, we sort of have a private model but it's certainly not provi- a private affordable universal access. We sort of have a patchwork system of employer and government programs that still leaves tens of millions of uninsured out there. So consequently, we spend the most on health care, uh, but have the lowest outcomes. And in that Commonwealth Fund study, we ranked dead last, number 11 out of the 11 studied. Again, the UK was it was in the top five. And I'd also note that the United States was sort of an outlier even at the bottom. If we looked at uh, a couple of other countries in the bottom of the ranking, 10, 9, and 8, the United States performance at number 11 was well, well below even the worst performing countries at 8, 9, and 10. So let's not so quickly condemn what we see in other countries because in general, in the aggregate, health outcomes and efficiency uh, is much better in other countries, developed countries, than we see here in the United States. But let's go a little deeper, and let's really sort of talk about a couple of different conclusions here. Um, So number one, these other developed countries, again, socialized medicine, single payer, and private affordable universal access do tend to do a few things right, as the Commonwealth Fund study seems to indicate. Number one, they are able to provide coverage to about 99% of their citizens. In the United States, we have an uninsured rate of, I would say, between 8 and 10%, depending on, on the time. And I think it's really closer to 10% overall whereas in these other countries, the uninsured rate is about 1%. And so everyone virtually has access to, I'm going to say, most health services, right? We're going to set aside the waiting times and say everyone is covered pretty much and everyone has access to most health services. I would also say these other developed countries emphasize primary care, prevention, and wellness, and because of that upfront access to healthcare coverage, outcomes in the aggregate tend to be better. America clearly tends to have uh, underinvestment in primary care and disease management and things like that that we think about in primary care. And in these countries, too, healthcare is not treated as a commodity that you earn. But it is a basic right in these countries. So in these three examples, uh, you know, healthcare as a basic right, the emphasis on primary care, and the emphasis on coverage for all, I think these other developed systems, all three types, actually have it right. And that means that they have overall better outcomes, even the United Kingdom, than we do in America. At the same time, though, I think what the King Charles story shows in the articles about treatment delays in the United Kingdom, it tends to show that these three systems also actually tend to explicitly ration access in a number of different ways. And so let's talk about a couple of those here. Well, in the drug world, I would argue that there is uh, rationing, right? Um, again, I'm a big believer in drug price reform in the United States, but I want to be honest and talk about the pros and cons of that issue. So in other countries, drug formularies tend to be much tighter. Most developed nations have access, I would say, and studies vary here, but I would say they have access to no more than about half of the newly introduced treatments in the drug world. And big pharma in the United States talks about that a great deal. Now, one part of me says we have a terrible drug pricing and innovation system, and we probably don't need access to every drug. And it tends to drive prices 
and there are multiple drugs in the same innovation category, and they're way too expensive, and they probably don't add demonstrably to health in the world or in the United States. And high prices can also cost lives. But at the same time, there is some worry that in these other developed countries that you do not have access to every possible treatment in the latest treatment and treatment in the drug world tends to be rationed much more than in the United States. And in these cases of cancer or other disease states, that has impacts, higher morbidity, higher mortality, and things like that. Let's move on to actual sort of medical services. So as we've talked about already in the case of the UK, other developed nations tend to ration um, higher cost specialized care in a number of ways. So there tend to be fewer specialists, fewer expert facilities and technology investments. It doesn't mean that they don't have modern systems and can treat disease, but it just means that there are fewer specialists, expert facilities and investments. And some would argue the US overinvests in these areas, and I think that's true, but you can also make the case that these other developed nations underinvest in these areas. Global budgeting and other things tend to limit access and thereby creating waiting lists and excessive wait times to acquire treatment and diagnosis of some of these cancers and other uh, conditions that are very specialty in nature. And there's also clearly the inability to receive certain treatments. A good example uh, from my daughter's life that I've talked about in the blogs is, again, she actually has access to both the UK and the American healthcare system. Well, we deliberately kept American insurance given a brain condition she had. She's just gone through surgery and she's doing tremendously well. In the UK, she saw many delays in accessing specialists and MRIs and drugs for her conditions. Uh, the UK likely would have deprioritized my daughter's brain surgery, probably for several years, I'm guessing, if she were able to receive it at all. Here in the United States, we made the decision to sort of have the surgery. Actually, it was my daughter courageously making that decision and being, bringing me along. Uh, we did this in early January, given some conditions that were popping up over the last couple of years. She went to the specialist in early January, received the MRI she needed to plan for it, and actually had her surgery in late February uh, in a matter of seven weeks. Uh, and she's doing tremendously well. If this were an urgent situation, the time would have been less in the United States. But there's every reason to believe that uh, she may not have been able to get the surgery in the UK and perhaps in other developed nation systems as well. So that is sort of the pros and cons of what we see out there in the UK and other developed systems against the United States. Let's take another quick break here and we will come back to sort of sum up this week's podcast. Health plans and insurance are confusing. Our healthcare system is in dire need of reform. Health policy expert Mark Ryan tackles both issues in his book, The Healthcare Labyrinth. It is both a guide to navigating health plans and fixing American health insurance. Mark dives deep into how health plans and the American health insurance system operate. He then outlines a comprehensive reform agenda for the system as a whole, including pricing, emphasizing health and care management, and ensuring affordable access to health coverage in a private delivery model. Mark is a bit of an unconventional Republican in that he believes affordable access is the morally right thing to do and that it is also fiscally prudent for our nation. Learn more about Mark's book, The Healthcare Labyrinth, at healthcarelabyrinth.com or search at leading bookseller websites. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook forms. So welcome back from the break. Uh, and so when we uh, got to break, we said we were going to just sum up a bit on what we've learned today uh, with this um, discussion about King Charles's uh, cancer and treatment and what 
other average citizens in the United Kingdom uh, see in terms of treatment, how that actually is in all of the rest of the developed world over America. And we went through some of the pros and cons here. So in sum, going back to the Commonwealth Fund study, it shows that other nations, regardless of the type of system they have, tend to have better health outcomes overall in the aggregate, as I say. And the systems cost much, much less than America. But as we saw in the UK and we see in some of the other developed countries, mortality and morbidity can actually be higher in certain situations, as such as cancer and other kind of conditions, because of the implicit rationing of these types of services. But again, let's not trash these other systems unjustly. Yes, here in America, the wealthy and those with strong insurance tend to have good outcomes that can rival other developed nations or exceed them. They also tend to have access to timely care, technology-driven care, and the most up-to-date treatments. Simply, we can have the absolute best here in the world in the United States if we need it. The problem, though, is that the tens of millions of underinsured in America and uninsured get the worst of both worlds. They don't get the security blanket of coverage and access to upfront primary care wellness and prevention and other services that are really found in other developed countries like the UK. And that tends to promote better overall aggregate outcomes, as I pointed out. And their mortality and morbidity from cancers, other conditions, and ongoing disease states such as diabetes, asthma, and cardiac conditions tend to mirror the UK use cases as we discussed. They don't get diagnosed quickly, if ever. They don't get treated. Uh, and if they do, it is often too late, as, as may be the case in UK and other countries. Um, so again, uh, the very wealthy and the well-insured in the US get the best of all worlds, high tech, quick access, and have great outcomes. But the underinsured probably have it worse than others do in the developed world because they don't get the security of coverage or access to primary care, and they tend to fall into the poor access or delayed access to specialty services that we see in this use case in the United Kingdom. So in conclusion, you know, the way I think about it is in America, we tend to ration care and access by insurance status and income. Um, these other systems tend to ration across the board by global budgets affecting everyone. The cracks in that system are leading to wealthier folks to close those gaps by paying for private insurance and priv private facility access. I think in the end, there's a middle ground here. And I think the U.S. can build that middle ground. We can emphasize modern technology, high-tech, swift access, but also create a system that covers everyone. We may pay slightly more than what other developed nations do, but I do believe that what we pay if we rationalize the system would be well less as a percentage of gross domestic product than we actually pay today. With that, we'll end this podcast and we'll see you on the next Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. Take care. Thanks for joining Mark and the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. Go to healthcarelabyrinth.com each day for the latest healthcare news. See you next week on the next Healthcare Labyrinth podcast.